Hello, I'm working on this Honda 500 TRX for a friend. Uh, it had had a catastrophic um, seizure and uh, a breakup of the piston. As you can see the bits and the deposits on the old cylinder here and some bits in the bottom of the pot. There was a lot of debris all through the engine. Uh, the crankshaft, uh, the conrod, uh, the conrod was uh, is in quite a state, as you can see. Um, so we have a replacement crankshaft, a uh, second-hand crankshaft, but a, a good one. Um, but I thought I'd just visit... This is typical Honda, and it's just so beautifully engineered. And as you know from my other videos, most of the stuff that I work on is uh, much earlier than this. And, and uh, I just thought I'd just... Um, just run through a couple of points at this stage with you and share share with you. Um, it took me a little bit of time to research all the, all the uh, different pointers, uh, so perhaps I can pass some of that on. Um, this is fairly common. There's a a stake cut. They deliberately damage the the nut. The sort of if you like a, a soft area on the nut so that it can be collapsed into on the end of the crankshaft here. So that it can be collapsed into um, into that that section there, into that sort of cutout there. So when the nut's fully fitted, and when the nut's fully fitted, you would collapse that ring in and lock the nut. The problem is when you come to undo it, it often damages the threads in that in that area around that section, um, and so. It, these threads were damaged, um, but all's not lost, and this is something very useful to have in your toolbox. I have here a thread file, and uh, for, the, for those who haven't seen a thread file before, it uh, it's really invaluable, it really can get you out of a lot of trouble. Uh, so you identify which thread you need, just simply by, by holding it against the thread. There's a metric and a thread file for the various threads, uh, so it's always good to have a couple of the different sorts in your toolbox. Um, and then once you've found uh, the thread that you need, you just uh, apply it to the, to the thread, and it's best to work your way around. It'll naturally follow from the good thread. It'll naturally follow its way, make its way up. And as you're, as you're working it, if you do a, a rocking motion, this is similar for stoning radiuses and uh, uh, sort of curved surfaces like this, like perhaps if, you, if you're recovering rockers that open the valves on an engine. Uh, you can recover quite a lot by using an oil stone, and you do this rocking motion against the radius, the opposite radius, and work your way around. And you can see this, this was actually quite bad, and... Uh, now that nut spins on just that first portion and allows it go on to go on down to the good portion very easily. So that's a good recovery tip to have. Um, this engine has got a balance shaft and uh, it's important. On this particular engine, look, uh, you've got a, a little line on the balance on the balance drive gear. Here, just scribed into the teeth. I've highlighted it with a white marker. And cast, it's difficult to see, but cast into the crankshaft, there's a line here. Uh, and I've picked that out with some tipex as well. So it's important that those two are timed as you put the two together there. Uh, this bluing and everything, that's okay. You see the bluing also up so far on, uh, on the conrod itself. Difficult to point to the film. Uh, that's okay, that's part of their local heat treatment and, uh, or, or their heating uh, to, uh, to provide the fittings and it's in a controlled way, so it's, uh, that's perfectly acceptable. So different areas of the rod will be different hardness. That isn't because of uh, overheating in the engine or anything like that. Another little pointer is... Um, Again, this is just so beautifully engineered. You have this uh, this 
drums, if you like, uh, which has got lots of grooves in it. And those grooves, each groove corresponds to a, select, uh, a selector fork. And for this particular engine, as you assemble it, you need to get this dowel, point this dowel in line with that, where the rocker shaft, sorry, the selector shaft will go. So this, excuse me, I'm doing it with the left hand and it's sort of opposite in the camera. But this will drop down through, locate, and uh, uh, so it's important to have that dowel on that side pointing through the centre line. And everything then lines up really nicely. I could show you, but it's too difficult to do single handed. Um, I did have a selector here to show you, but uh, obviously now I've walked off with it when the time comes. I had a couple of attempts at filming this, and I've had steam trains, ambulances, and a puppy interrupting me, so we might get there this time. The surfaces, um, I use an oil stone um, to, to dress the surfaces just very lightly. You, invariably there will be bruising from various things really in its life previously. Um, uh, uh, I try really hard not to damage any of these when you split the casing. And um, in this one, I don't think there is any damage from splitting the case. Uh -huh. There's the other selector fork as well. Um, there isn't any from splitting the case, but you still get burrs and things. And, and this particular one doesn't run a gasket, so uh, we will put uh, some silicon seal or um, weld seal onto this onto this joint face. It's important if it's not meant to have a gasket that you don't put a gasket in because. Obviously, it would upset all the end floats that have been carefully set up um, by the factory. So I just thought that would be uh, uh, just uh, uh, just some good pointers for you to to see. Um, there was one other thing. Um, just whilst we're at this stage, on the gearbox. You can see those, those are selector, uh, sorry, those uh, drive dogs, really. They're, they're not made of some commercial or anything. Um, literally, it's just dogs that, that uh, would engage, and they engage into the respective gear or, or, or the sliding mesh section accordingly. Um, one thing I noticed is, is a couple of important points. Um, there are different depths and different types of teeth for engagement these teeth that some they're slightly smaller some are bigger and they go in different depths um, if you don't I, th I think you would never be able to actually assemble it wrong but it would be really annoying to have to disassemble it so do watch out to make sure that you get the right dog if you like engaging into the, into the right drive side there because uh, um, that could cost you some time and having to, to fiddle with it again afterwards. And the same also, this sleeve, this spline sleeve, these sleeves slip on and they're different lengths. So you can't really get it on wrong, but again, it'd be a nuisance if you got this far and then realise you can't case it, your cases won't go together. And also, the, this is a bush that engages with the spline and uh, it then is a plain bush inside of this gear. Everything is so beautifully made. Um, and you'll see there's a drilling there. Do make sure there's several options, but do make sure that you have your drilling lined up so that you get a true oil feed all the way through the bush into the running surface of here. So that's just a, a couple of pointers there. Be very careful of thrust washers. I don't think I can properly demonstrate to you left-handed, but do make sure that that thrust washer is um, clear of the outside and also where to 
some kind of a thrust, thrust washer might go against the journal or something. Make sure that radius doesn't foul that corner up here in the thrust washer. Doesn't foul the inside of the radius. That's an important one this one, but on some places. And that holds true with many engines, most engines really. Uh, this is probably, this radius issue is probably one of the single most problems that I've found, although it hasn't necessarily caused a problem because often the engines I take apart are 80 or so years old and they've been running fine, but but that's often something that's, that's overlooked. Uh, do keep an eye on that radius. Glue the washer if necessary with engineer's glue. And just check the compact area to make sure that the thrust is going through the face of the washer as opposed to the inner radius there. And as I say, that's generally on older engines. I'm, I'm really sort of speaking uh, retrospectively just from experience really there. But this is just such a beautifully made engine engine the, the the work is quite com quite complex there's quite a lot going on for just a 500 cc single it's got multiple clutches and multiple drives and low ratios and ancillary drives and all sorts excuse the wind in the background i moved it out uh, to film this because it's, it's just a bit of a better light as the day is getting on uh, oil pump here There's the oil pump, if I can show you, this is a left-handed work. So with the oil pump, the, I the issues are, are the same across the board with many, many models of oil pump or, or engine models, even dating quite a long quite a way back. This design really doesn't wear a great deal at all, but you need to pop a failure gauge in here. In this one's particular case, you've got the maximum wear is 10 thou. Um, so as long as you're below 10 thou, the brick on its theory will operate, um, that's fine. And then a failure gauge to measure the tip of, the, of this rotor within the second sort of rotor housing. So this tip here, a failure gauge in there, and make sure you've got eight or or a, a maximum of eight thou just to stop the oil from bleeding back from the high pressure to the low pressure and the same really across the surface if you put a straight edge across the face ideally uh, you what you, you don't really want any very negligible clearance just a small amount of clearance again if you start getting towards four or five six and more uh, then you're likely to get oil to bleed out of the high pressure system. So, uh, and again, that sort of, that holds for quite a lot of engines really, even sort of dating back quite a long way. The gear type, and the gear type of pumps and that sort of thing, same sort of, same sort of criteria really. In fact, I use a, uh, this isn't for this engine, but this is sort of a, a typical example. I use a sheet and I use sort of a gen generic sheet, so I kind of uh, just tick off everything. I have one for assembly and one for inspection. And I tick everything off, make it notes, make measurements, make a note of measurements. And then in brackets here, because I work on so many engines that are quite rare and unheard of, um, I have a sort of a generic sort of what you might expect for a typical design. So that gives me some pointers and it gives us something to to warn the customer off before and after, really. Talking about customers, um, this is very time consuming just to clean out all of the debris, uh, to dress all the faces, and it's, it's really worth dressing the faces. It's something that needs to be done. Um, in recovering things like this, um, it's quite a lot of work, and it's not something that can really be, be rushed. I think it's such a well-made, robust engine that Probably you could throw it together and you know, nothing, n no one would really notice the difference, but um, in fact it's solvable, you take a great deal of care and then overlook something, but it really is worth remembering. Um, it, if you're a person who's asking somebody to build an engine like this and you ask them to do it on a budget, you, you must really remember it's still at the very best going to be quite time consuming to do, to do all of this work. And it's not really fair to ask someone to cut corners because
because at the end of the day, their name is important. Okay, well, thank you for looking in. Um, may update this or put some more videos on a bit later and just see how it all goes. But we're getting there and it's a, a real pleasure now, once the cleaning has been done, um, to, to start to get it together. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.